yourself? Yeah, my name is Laura, and I apologize. I've been sick. I contracted something while here. And so I'll try to project as much as possible. And um, I'm a little out of it because I'm drugged up. But <laughs> feel free to ask questions if I say something you don't understand or if I'm going too fast or too slowly. Just speak up. So um, I was hired as a QA manager um, mid-December, so I'm fairly new here. Um, and uh, so although I wasn't part of the Curriculum Management 2.0 project, um, there's a lot of room for improvement and processes that we've put in place. And going forward, we'd like to, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who do you work with? R-SMART, ah. sorry. Um, but she's actually a KS core. Yeah. Uh, team so it's hired as the KS QA manager. So, um, so QA quality assurance. Um, most people think of testing, and that's a big part of quality assurance. But um, it's not all of quality assurance. So when we think of quality assurance, we want to think of a comprehensive from beginning to end of a given software development lifecycle. So we want to think of what we can do to ensure quality in the software from the beginning, and then also after post implementation. So what we do release processes, um, what we can do um, during the requirements gathering to ensure that by the time it gets to development and testing that um, everyone's on the same page and can understand what we're doing. So um, as part of our testing process, um, we put together a, um, a, there's a lot of documentation links in this wiki. Um, on this uh, Google Doc, and um, the Google Doc is going to be shared. So feel free to go through this and all the documentation, because I won't go through it in detail. But there's a lot of good information on there. Um, so, but some of the highlights that I want to go through um, in the QA testing process is that um, from the beginning we have our manual test cases. And when I say manual, this means that someone takes the requirements, understands them and then writes them down. So it's not code written, it's actual human language written in some kind of format. Um, we do this in JIRA, and JIRA is also a documenting and, and ticket um, system. So we are able to link our test cases to um, bugs that we find, um, and then make sure that we have accurate test coverage also to our requirements that are in JIRA. So, um, as well as manual test cases, we have something called automated functional tests, um, which are also tracked in JIRA. Um, we came up with an automated testing framework, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on that, um, the technologies involved that we use, but um, that just means that our, um, our QA engineers will write code um, against the, um, the, the actual functional code for the uh, product and um, run the test and, um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, as part of, let me just go to kind of. So I'd like to ask a general sure. question. So I know that the quality, the 14 logs there by Sierra, right? um, as a school implement set, are we having our own Instance of Jira where we're kind of testing ourselves. Is that how um, Maryland? That's what we've done. Yeah, I mean, you can do it that way. Um, and Mar as um, Michelle said, yes, Maryland does it that way. It's it's just an easy way to um, while you're implementing track your own in your own system and not get any other outside instances. But um, there's you can also um, if it's easier. I mean, from um, us accessing a JIRA ticket, which it's, a, it's the same kind of tool, so it's easier for us as well. Um, if there's something during your testing or you have questions, then it's easy. So let me just go to um, I'll, um, our wiki page, which is, dot, which is linked in the presentation, um, just to take a step back for a minute. So um, as part of our QA testing, and this is hard to see, but um, this is all kind of has links to um, our different documentation, our functional framework, automation framework um, components. And there's a, there are definitions between the different types of testing um, because I think 
that not everyone understands or knows that there are different types of testing during a software development lifecycle. So whatever methodology you use, waterfall or agile, and we tend to use agile when we say that we have chunks of time where we're, we plan out and take um, some pieces of work and then the, the development, the BAs, the testers, um, decide how much they can do in a given time frame. So we do two, what we call two week, two to three week sprints, and those sprints just mean we complete that chunk of work in that given time. So that means uh, all requirements, all development, all testing. And so the different types of testing that we do during that time, the unit level testing is going to be what the developers do, and they do this on their own local machine. So they write the code and then they compile it and then they run unit level tests. And that just means it's a very small portion. It doesn't touch other parts of the system. So if they're working on a tiny little button feature, they might just test that the button works when you click it and it doesn't give an error. So not in relation to the rest of the system. Um, something called, um, when I say functional iteration, iterative testing or integration testing, that's what we do during the three week sprints. And those are our manual and functional automated tests. Um, and that's run on an environment that has a, we call a nightly build. So every night we get a new version of the software that's deployed to this environment. And then we run all of our tests on that and they must pass. So if they fail in the morning, you know, we get notification and then um, it's, uh, someone has to, to make sure that those tests pass. Um, so what we, that's called the functional inter, um, integration testing. Um, when you hear something like smoke test or sanity test, that's just high level, basic end to end kind of test to make sure major components of the system are there. And you usually do that after um, a build to a new environment. Um, so, uh, and then something called, I won't go through all the, the different types of testing, but the regression testing. Regression testing is usually something done on a, not a nightly build environment, but something more stable. So um, what we call our staging environment. So when we are ready to do more comprehensive testing, um, we have more scenario-based tests. And these are called regression tests. And these are... Um, so sit, we'll do system end-to-end -end testing and then regression just means old tests that aren't necessarily related to the new features that are introduced, but we wanna make sure we didn't break anything. Um, so we'll take a, um, a build and we call it a tagged build. So we tag it as this is something that possibly might be like a release candidate or this is a stable, it's not going to change. And so that we can test on it for a period of time without something moving underneath us. And then we run all those tests. And um, the bug um, workflow is pretty much the same, except that once we're in this phase, when we do discover bugs, um, it's usually at a point where we've gone through several iterations of integration testing. And this is where we have to um, decide, you know, if it's urgent enough, do we need to fix it for a release? Because once we're on staging, we're usually working on a, you know, a, something that we were planning on releasing. So we have guidelines over the uh, priorities of bugs in JIRA. So if it's urgent or if it's a blocker, we have to fix it. Um, that means when we find a bug that goes to the top of the list, those go to the top of the list, our developers work on those first, and then we redeploy and retest. If it's a kind of a medium urgency or a low minor bug, then those also get um, on our backlog of bugs. But um, if uh, we can make the executive decision uh, to release with those known issues, just putting them in the release notes of known issues. So um, that's only once we get to that point in time of a Russian test. Okay, so let me go back to the presentation. That's just kind of an overview um, a little bit, not so you totally. Do you have any questions on that so far? Uh, thanks. I just kind of skipped over that. <laughs> no questions.
All right. I'll just mention that um, bug urgency is actually something to be taken seriously because if you start putting everything as blocker or urgent or whatever, you're right. not going to get the bugs you want fixed done. It's just nobody's going to take you seriously. Right, and that's a good point. And then part of this documentation is, um, you know, our workflow, how how we enter bugs, what information needs to go in there, and then the definitions around the priority. So take a look at, you don't have to necessarily use these same priorities, but these are pretty standard and within software development. Um, and then really take a look. So if you if you classify something as a blocker, that means that it's catastrophic. It means like you can't do anything else in the system. There's a major error um, that's blocking you from getting anywhere else. Um, you go to log in and then uh, an error screen comes in. Okay, that's a blocker because you can't get into the system. <laughs> okay, um, critical, there may be a workaround, but it's really cumbersome and then you would not want to deploy with this. Um, and then major um, might be a workaround, but it's not ideal, but we could live with it, you know, maybe until the next patch release. So um, I would encourage you to, um, you know, take a look at these definitions and then when you are entering tickets, be cognizant of that um, as well because yeah I, a lot of times what someone th if it's ambiguous at all someone's like well it's a blocker to me you know it's what a what it's a blocker to one person might not be a blocker to someone else and um, development really can only work on you know really one thing at a time um, and it has to be prioritized question for you during the mosh pit testing we have been students sitting there we would, if we found something, yeah. we would put it in, in the target. Anyway, he would go in and he would review it and, and tag it as Correct. being what, what the priority is of it. Did you have that um, on, on the your QA test? So during our QA testing, um, our triage, that's just called bug triage. So someone is usually the point person and then divides out the work to the developers. So developers aren't getting bombarded with. Um, with bugs. Um, so what we do is part of our process and we have different teams uh, on East Coast, West Coast, working on different parts of the development system. So when we worked on curriculum management, what we did is we had a dedicated QA tester and development team and then a lead person that was designated as that triage person. So we would enter bugs daily, and um, there would be a quick review. The, the QA person on the, the project is uh, aware of all the existing issues, so there wouldn't be any kind of um, duplicate, um, uh, any kind of, they wouldn't enter a duplicate because they know all the, the bugs. And we have these um, daily meetings where we go over kind of the main issues at a time. Um, so we'll have the scrum meetings, which are just basically the, the core team, the development and QA and VA and the lead. And they would just go over any major issues, what happened yesterday, what they're planning on working on today, uh, if there's any blocking issues, and if there are, what can we do to resolve those? And part of those are any major bugs. So the, the lead person would, um, if any new bugs came up, they would uh, immediately prioritize them in the backlog assign them to a developer, and the developer would just every day come in, know what, exactly what bugs they need to work on. <clears throat> so it was a little different. At the point of a mosh pit, it's, um, it's past the point of QA. So we've already done, um, hopefully, we've already done our integration testing, we've already done our regression testing, we've already gone through that, and you're on a stable build. So you shouldn't, the bugs that are found either should already be known issues and that's why Ben took that role and he wanted to make sure that is it something we already know about? And if so, we don't want to, you know, just send that over, throw that over the wall. Or is it something um, like a design issue that we, it's not really a bug, but like we probably should document it somewhere. Um, so at that point, um, that's when you would probably um, have someone kind of at a, that knows, that knows all the issues. Um, at that point. Um, if, I, if I can just yeah. interject, I think what we've found during that time at Maryland has been that 
you really do need a gatekeeper somehow between yeah. the functional testers and the JIRA because um, uh, the functional folks don't even know what JIRA to look for to make sure that there's not, that this isn't a known item. Right. So we, I might say the little icon on the tab doesn't have a picture, you know, there's no picture in that little square on the top of the tab and that's a bug. I might say, well, what am I going to look for in JIRA to make sure I'm not logging a duplicate? And so I'll look for like icon and I won't see it anywhere. But that's not what that thing's called. I can't remember what it's called. Yeah. It's not my job to remember what it's called. Um, but but I, I know that we have a we at Maryland have a JIRA for that because we had to figure out what that thing was. Um, and so I really, um, I really thought it was helpful and, and not just because it was my idea um, to have some central place that then Ben could take over from, but where we were putting all of the issues that we found because having the use the, the users going straight into the JIRA no, is a mess. That. Yeah. yeah. I, JIRA is basically for um, developers and the QA engineers or testers at that level during the integration testing where they, they're in the system, they know, they use the ticketing system. Once you get to the point where it's the mosh pit or functional testing, ex user acceptance testing phase, um, or you have functional people testing the system, um, you're going to need um, a point of contact, like a functional lead person and log issues not in JIRA because yeah like Michelle said it's it's uh if you're not used to logging tickets in JIRA or trying to find, find you'll spend more time trying to do that than actually logging issues. So the other question that I have is for Zula and Michelle. So the you know, follow up on last week's question really it was that Kowali students had um, developed you know 2.0 and so they put in new functionality, but there was already existing functionality, and we wanted, we wanted to test it and make sure that you know, the new functionality worked and that we were breaking the test. Right. Implementing, and, and we followed this exact process for um, one of my groups that actually develops software. They develop self-service applications, and you know, they have a, a QA person who goes in there and tests everything before it goes to the user and kind of coordinates with the users as they test them. So mm -hmm. I'm understanding and this whole thing makes sense. How do you, how do you fit this process for an implementation of software that you're not going to write code for? So we're just, you know, we're going to put curriculum management 2.0 in right. there. Um, and we just want to make sure that, you know, So you're going to be at a higher level. You're not going to um, be as when when I say went through the different levels of testing. You're going to be more at um, a functional integration, more at that regression testing point. So you're going to make sure that when you implement that, the software end to end does all the major things that you need it to do. So you're going to do more of scenario based testing. Um, so kind of similar to what went on in the mosh pit testing. Um, we have something called our smoke test, which is, like I said, it's kind of like a high level scenario based, much like the, the mosh pit. You're going to want to do, um, and I can show you examples of that. Actually, that was back here. Okay, and what you're talking about is kind of what we do. When yeah. We have to do something for direct lending where we had to write it and we put together what the processes were that the you know, financial aid needed to go through and we made sure that each one of those worked. So but that was what we did a lot more in unit testing with that, because that was tough to develop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I will say, just putting your own data in curriculum management, you're going to find a lot of things broken. I was just going to say, yeah. I would I would not so expect that this don't believe that you're not doing customization yeah. or integration. No, I'm, I'm figuring I am, but, yeah. but I'm sitting here, you know, so Kathy needs to create a course. 
So that's that's a test that we would do. Okay, go through and and create a port. Right here, we need to modify a port and all those little different options that you talked about yesterday with the version, with no version, with the version. Are you going to try to batch load your current catalog list? Yes. Yeah, as soon as yeah. you do that, yeah. you're going to break things, by the way. Yeah. Well, and we, so we had, we had um, the tickets in our JIRA system that loaded everything, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the tickets for data loading, the tickets for data, you know, the, the integration tickets, right? And then we had test tickets that we did as well. So our data team sat during those mosh pits and said, okay, do I see, you know, compare this to this, compare that to that. And so some of our mosh pitting was scenario based where, it will, right. and, and we really moved from full on test cases where it said, log in as this, look at this screen, then do this, then look at this screen, then do this. There was some of those, but there were also some of the, just try to create a course and right. see what happens because then you get kind of coverage on both fooling around, right? The users yeah. fooling around with the system versus the users doing exactly what you tell them to do. You're gonna have different levels of testing and you're gonna to need to um, decide on that level of testing based upon what you change. So if you are loading data and you're gonna to need to do um, more um, scenario based and making sure the data flows from one end system to the other, then you're going to have those types of testing. Um, if you're doing specific customization and configuration, you're going to maybe have more um, functional tests that are around that specific feature. Um, and I would suggest that you do when you create your JIRA system that you track all of these changes in JIRA, associate them with tests, so link them to tests. Um, and then that uh, also, when, so when you find bugs, you can link them to also to your test. Um, and that will be the easiest way to see, you know, what parts of the system have changed, which parts you've already covered in testing, um, and where you might need to add more tests. Um, so, as part of a, a scenario-based higher level testing, um, you know, you're gonna want to do, like I said, scenario-based, you know, you wanna try different browsers if that's what you are supporting. Um, just kind of think of different different things um, as in terms of your security and admin, logging in, different user privileges, um, just basic things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, just one thing on performance testing. So we do do um, performance testing. And what that means is for curriculum management 2.0, um, we did performance testing is, a, is kind of a broad term and it encompasses a lot of different types of testing. So it includes kind of um, things like load testing where you're loading up, ramping up users, virtual users on a specific part of the system to see how much much load you can handle on a specific part of the system. We have scalability testing. Um, there's um, endurance type testing where you'd run a, t a specific test for a long period of time and see and watch for memory leaks. Um, what we did in curriculum management 2.0 is we did load tip tests testing and we did it on a specific part of the system. Um, going forward, uh, we're actually in the process of building a comprehensive performance test strategy, which is going to include um, various types of performance testing. We just in the past two weeks built a new dedicated performance test environment, and we're doing kind of um, te uh, tests that, so we're running our, our original tests on our new environment, trying to get a baseline, and then trying to do different configurations to see um, what type of um, minimum uh, hardware requirements we might want to suggest for the future. So right now, um, I'm sure we already went through kind of the different configurations you might want to set up for production. Um, the way that we performance test, we do it on a, um, we have an Amazon EC2 cloud and we have a, a distributed environment. So we have different servers, Bryce and college student and we have um, 
right now we have an, uh, two different types of instances on the Amazon Cloud. We have an extra large and a large. And um, it's a dedicated environment, meaning that we don't actually start performance testing um, until we get to the point where we have a stable build. So that's later on in the process. And that's not doesn't mean that we don't gather any kind of metrics on performance of the system prior to that. That just means when we get to the point of actually running our comprehensive performance test, we're already on a tagged build um, on a so a release candidate build um, when we do regression testing and we're almost ready to release at that point. And things we look for, you know, um, bottlenecks, and we look for system resources, CPU <coughs> utilization, we look for memory, um, memory usage. Um, we look for response time um, when we ramp up users, um, things like that. Um, now, I will mention as part of our integration testing, when we're early on in the phase, when we're doing the development and integrate, integration testing, excuse me, uh, we're running our automated tests on that nightly build. Um, as part of those tests, we put in uh, performance timers on specific features, or functions in the code, and we um, give it a threshold. So we don't want, if this comes, this, you know, this feature is running, we're running this test and it is taking longer than five seconds, then fail the test. So that's something fairly new that we just, Implemented as well. So, can we pause there and have sure. some questions? Any more questions? There are functional people in here who are following what she's saying. You know what she means when she says we're monitoring CPU usage and all that. Okay, good. I guess we have to accept from a decent perspective to like when we do performance testing right. and above and beyond. Yeah, okay, we don't have. I would say if you have load runner that's awesome because um, that's actually a very expensive performance tool and it's comprehensive and you have everything there so if you can get someone who really knows how to yeah, use that, that tool that is the, that's the problem. we've had it for quite a while and we keep having these philosophical discussions as to where that role should be we think it should be in a tool or production services group that does scheduling of jobs and we think it should be over there they don't think it should be over there. So what we end up unfortunately doing is we go out and we hire a, um, a consultant who knows load runner and comes in and sits with us and right. kind of does that and then gives us the reports. Right. Um you have the same one over and over? We have. Okay. Yes. So they know they, they understand your business and yes. yeah, that's yeah, good. That's good. Um, I uh, in, in this presentation there are links to our performance test strategy and results. We um did not use LoadRunner. Um, we don't have access to that. We actually have our own, uh, we've developed our own framework and it uses um, various tools. We, we, the code, the actual code that runs the test is in Ruby, which is a, a programming, programming language. And then we have, um, we also use something called Sung and that, um, that's for um, gathering the metrics for the system resources and reporting on those. Um, so if you have a comprehensive tool that someone can use, that's, that's great. But if you want to take a look, that it's all on um, Wiki reference. I, I, there are some links here to our documentation. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot is, on is our... Is all the source code available, too, that was used for all this kind of testing? So, um, yes. Automated, automated testing. Automated testing, yep. It's open source. Um, we can make it available. Um, so our functional automated testing, um, I quickly went over, is during our um, 
integration testing phase when we're doing those three week sprints, two to three week sprints, and we're having the, we're on the nightly build server. So every more every night, new version of the software comes out. We run the test. The automated tests are automatically run against that server. If anything fails, um, the designated person is notified and they have to fix those tests. So those tests uh, follow a specific framework. Um, now, it's something we, um, I'll, I'll throw out some terms here. It's all documented on the wiki. If you're interested, you can look through it, but I won't go through all of it. Um, it's something called Cucumber. And um, so this is something called, uh, this is at the highest level. And this is something that either a QA engineer or a BA can write in, in a language called Gherkin. And it's <laughs> plain language kind of. Uh, so it uses if then uh, kind of statements, specific specification by example. Um, so they're plain text files. Um, it they describe the core business value of the feature um, and the scenarios. And then what happens is the either the QA engineer um, takes those files or the uh, developer, whoever is writing the actual automated tests, will take those and then translate them into code using Ruby. And those are called step files. So it uses the Ruby code to parse through that text file and write code to understand the, the actual human language. Could you um, give us an, an example of what, like a cucumber? Um, I think I have examples <clears throat> on here. Okay. Um, In my mind, you know, if, if, if BC already has sort of a, an automated test suite and performance testing setups, you know, then do we use these or do we not? So that's something you have to make a decision on. Um, well, it's also the focus test, it does not sound like they're on it. Right. We do not have on it. We keep talking about it, but yeah. Automated yeah. testing is something that you have to invest in as you go, but yeah. it's so worth it by the end. Yeah. And every time you make a change, it, it pays you back. Yeah. If you don't do it, you end up doing the mosh bits forever. Yeah. And yeah, to the extent that you can get those things going, I mean, it's killed Maryland that we don't have them. That said, the GWT, like whatever you guys have managed to do, let's talk to them because I think the GWT issue was really hitting at us on the automation that it's, yeah. that it's hard to automate it because of the GWT. And the other thing is um, we went, once we wrote our tests, we were always putting the same course number in we added a feature that didn't allow you to reuse the course number at Maryland, and then all the tests failed. So you want to do something that doesn't hardwire in that number or whatever. Here's just an example of um, the actual feature file. So written in that language, the Gherkin language. So you can see it's pretty straightforward. And um, so the feature is enforce minimum balance requirements on withdrawals. Um, so you would start with, in order to ensure that all accounts maintain a minimum balance as the bank, I want to ensure that the withdrawals would bring in an account below minimum are not allowed. The scenario is withdrawals that would bring account below minimum balance are not allowed. Given the minimum balance required is $50 and I have $89.99 in my account, when I tried to withdraw $40, then, so it kind of follows an if then, there's a specific terminology you abide by um, in this language, but it's, as you can see, it's kind of human readable, you understand it. Um, so the developers or the QA test engineer, whoever's writing the actual uh, code for the tests will take this and then write um, something <coughs> called step files. And that's Ruby code. And we have um, access to our repository if you want to see, uh, and a description of our entire framework. Um, so, you know, kind of the cucumber, the feature files, step definitions, the framework that uses the um, test factory gem, um, page object files, and data objects. There's these are more like technical terms that during when you're developing a test in Ruby, you need to have page objects and data objects, um, which I won't kind of go through. But all this documentation is also um, on the wiki and it's linked in the presentation if you choose to use that. Um, so I won't go through that. Um, I already went through kind of our performance, but we also have an automation 
um, framework that was also built in house. Um, and right now, like I, I mentioned before, we are in the process of completely redesigning that. We're coming through with a new environment, new test, overall test strategy, um, whether or not we're going to use new tools. Um, but our existing one that we used for um, 2 O as a guideline is also on the wiki. Um, and I kind of already went through the um, our smoke test. Our, um, I showed our mosh pit um, as an example of any kind of high level test you might want to do kind of at the end phase when you're doing more acceptance level testing, um, the scenario based tests. Um, or why is it called a smoke test? Um, why is it called a smoke test? Because early on in software development, um, when something, when a new version would come out, they would actually um, test it by, um, it was, uh, the hardware would actually smoke if it was not working. So <laughs> that's how you know if it's working or not. If it's not smoking, it passes. <laughs> so, Whoa, seriously? I know, seriously. I thought it had something to do with like some old smoke, you know, like smoke it's smoke, like, yeah, or something yeah, like that. Fire or not. So, so wow. that's, that's why it's the highest level. Like basically right. all you're looking to do is make sure that the computer doesn't catch fire. So wow. it's not, it's not, it's, pretty minimal as far as requirements <laughs> right it's very high level it's just like, it's also called a sanity test so you know make sure you can log in do basic things things don't blow up you know um virtually and but um i have seen computers actually smoke though so <laughs> <laughs> when a lot of processes are running I'm like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, actually, <laughs> unlike my car, which did happen a few weeks ago. I was like, that's not good. I used to work with gateway computers, and it was true. Yeah. Now, usually once the magic smoke escapes, it starts like, it stops working. Yeah. It's a whole magic it's smoke. It's a magic smoke. Right, right. Um, so I just kind of want to, does anyone have any questions before I move on? I mean, the um, basically what I want to get out of this is, you know, what what you guys at BC, what we can do to help improve the process. Like I said, I'm fairly new. Um, there's a lot of things I think that we can work on and we are working on for an, our enrollment um, project that we're putting in place pro, uh, new procedures and processes, new tests, more testing, different types of testing, new environments. Um, but the thing I want to um, what we want to get is information from you to make that better. So manual function, functional tests uh, documented in Jira, like we said, um, or a wiki, whatever is easiest for you. It depends on the type of test. Like I said, if it makes sense to have it um, at the lower level, the detailed level in Jira, and then once you get to a broader audience and you have more scenario-based tests, acceptance testing, it may make sense to do a Google Doc or a wiki at that point. Um, automated functional tests um, that um, using a framework, some whatever framework you, we have a documented fr framework, but also that those failures um, should also be documented as bugs just as much as the manual test in, in your JIRA or Wiki. Um, performance testing, like we explained. Um, and any hardware recommendations. So once you get to the performance tests, point, um, you know, if you're doing configuration-based performance testing and you're, you're testing on various different configurations of hardware, um, we'd like to hear those recommendations and use that information uh, for our own tests and going forward for other um, institutions. Um, in, any implementation discoveries, anything you find while you're implementing, um, we want to know about. So communication is key and, you know, anything. So issues you encountered, lessons learned, anything would be valuable to us. Um, if you want to put. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. We're not at that place yet, but yeah, we will sort of throughout the process. Uh, as we Start to build some of that stuff based on it. So you have X number of 
but fourthly, there is no granularity to the EU. There's some configurations where we can customize it at all. I think those are all really important things to start by putting up um, someplace for not only for people who are in the EU have an account, but maybe for people who, you know, like Michelle was talking, that might just aren't a part of our Reduction to share as we go through the process. Uh, I would love that you guys have it all documented. I'm a firm believer in not being yeah. So, you know, so we will, we will look at any data that we simply say, well, geez, we thought that we should have exclusive data. Okay, perfect. Do not have any value, or that's just specific to something that you see, but rather share it and make it available here. Yeah. Okay, but you know, we can look at it Perfect. So, um, yeah, anything, suggestions, feedback for improvement, anything in our deployment process as well, because this is kind of a learning uh, learning thing for us. One thing that we have shared, but we don't know that that will ever be fixed, is um, the issue with um, the accounts that we actually install the system that developers have to have that the studios are not going to have the contact information that they have. Okay. The account. What is that? Yeah, we've heard about it a little bit yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that. Yeah. 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 Well, and I'll say the the other the other issue that we found around permissions. So that's what perks my ears up is that the um, the KS uh, doesn't have like it doesn't separate types of administrators. So if you're an admin, it's sort of this generic admin, right? As opposed to you've got technical administrators and functional administrators. And, and there are people that that can do some things and, and not others that that nuance isn't there. So you might want to think about that when you write some roles and also think about that in rights when you're writing roles, because um, there's really only the, the tech admins in rights that come kind of out of the box that you want to be able to let some of your functional people do the inserting of permissions in rights. So I know it's not QA, but since you talked about it, I'm bringing it up that you, you're, you're going to yeah, want it, it is because um, those are the types of things that we need to think about for our test when we're designing tests. So um, we need to know the different user roles. We need to, um, these are the questions as a QA engineer, we need to be thinking about so that we ask, you know, early on in the VAs. And if they haven't thought of things like that, then, okay, well, maybe we need to think about it before we get to the point of implementation. Um, you know, we need to have a strategy or a test that tests the various <coughs> different user roles and upgrade when we do do have a certain particular user login, um, things like that. So it's very helpful information also for so QA. Can I do a follow-up here? Yes, because we do have the application that uh, goes, goes to the status phase of the sysadmin kind of admission, the administrative role. Wow. So in, Curriculum management, can I have a role based on the department that I am attached to? Or is there any? You can create that role. You can absolutely create roles that are based on the department. Um, and and that's probably, you know, as we think our way down the path, um, that's what we're going to have to do, right? That some people are able to add other people in just for their own department. So it's definitely. I, I, as Norm said, like very early on, you, you've got Legos, right? And so you can build all sorts of things in rights and, and in a better UI even to be able to insert those. It's a matter then of the what's your priority. And, and so we early on said, you know, if it, if it takes Michelle four hours to do this, it's way better for Michelle to spend four hours putting people into roles than it is to take my developer time and or that my as in the lead developer was like my developer time doing that because it's going to take them three weeks 
right? And so it was a trade-off, like, up. <coughs> Michelle can eat that bucket of misery. Mm-hmm. Is that what he called it at Koali Days? That Michelle can eat that bucket of misery way better than the developers can because we're pushing to get out the door because we, we were hell bent on being live in production in the spring of 2012. That was, we were going to do it and that was what was going to happen. So, um, take, we took a shortcut (laughs) that, I mean, it's a shortcut that keeps on giving, right? Because it took another two months for us to get the role to let somebody else do it, not just me. But, um, yeah, and I think it's more important to get enrollment because now it's a school-based. <coughs> okay. Well, that's all I had. If anyone has any more questions. I, I had a couple questions about the bud filing process in Xero. No, we have different projects within our JIRA system, so um, several different projects. So it depends on um, kind of what we're working on this time. Why are you asking? Just to understand what the question is. I'm just trying to understand the bug filing process. I buy something from students for price. Okay. Is it Rice? If you find something in Rice, you generally file it with Rice. They have, they have normally we'll ask for a central person like vendor or waiter or somewhere like that. We don't want the entire school filing bugs. No, I understand that. That point was made clearly. But that, I mean, I might have to file bugs for Rice at some point. Right. right. Yeah, so Rice has its own project. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Clear. Thanks. I would yeah. recommend that. But, yeah. but we should probably document what is where, because there's, I know that's documented how to file a bug in Rice, but I don't know where it is right now. Somewhere in that wiki. I go to the wiki. Yeah, yeah I don't find the wiki to find how to file a bug in Rice because I've had to do it twice okay. now. That's that's you know. good enough for me. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll work for it. Usually, it's a good idea to add to post on the news group and tell them what you found, and they'll usually either create a bug for you or no, direct offer you. normally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. otherwise, you need you need to request access to the foundation, right? Jiras and things right. like that. And there's a whole process. There. You also may find that what you think is a bug, there's right. really not a bug. It's a feature. <laughs> uh, I'm just, you know, sure. no, and it's, it's true. an interpretation of what you're trying to do. So. It could be, yeah, it could be a bug or it could be implemented that way on purpose or something like that. It seems like a bug, but it's not from your perspective. What they want to do. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, we found one like that in Rice, where in at Maryland, we did not like that if you did something and you initiated it, it didn't show up in your outbox. And we were like, what a terrible bug that it doesn't show up. And we go went back to Rice and said, do you guys want this? Do you want us to contribute back? And they said, no way. We do not want that. Like, that is, we've been clear. It's going to muck up your outbox. We don't want it. And so we considered it a bug. They consider it a feature because they don't, there are other requirements being met by it. A really stupid question. Maybe I just missed this. Do we create our own environment here for Zero? Or yes, we do. You yeah. should have your own. Yeah. Yeah. We should have our own for our bugs because they could be, and then we have to figure and look at them and then we kind of okay, is this a bug that would get elevated up to the Koala you know, the, the Koala Zero that we could always use the current system to call that one for all the bugs that customer service center. We won't use service center. No, it's going to be service center for us. Yes. We'll actually ask you for any bugs you submit. Yeah. We'll ask you to use the fix for us if we consider it a bug. And it's community <laughs> supported, right? So. so I, my, I'm anticipating the majority of bugs that we find are going to be specific bugs. Um, I'm not sure how many of them are going to be bugs. And I'd like to go to the or we're talking about like a, cat, a category. So it could be bugs related to data loading. Well, in this afternoon, when we talk about synthesizing requirements, and I, I'm actually, as we've been, as you all have been talking, I've been adding slides to the PowerPoint, so don't, um, don't download it yet. 
that have Jira screens in them and talk about how to write a Jira and, and what you're going to have to think about and, and why to do that and versus not. So um, I'll, I'll try to at least give you a kickstart on that conversation this afternoon. Sean, I'm curious why you said if we're going to automatically vote data, why would we keep your... Oh, I'm just going to follow it. up on that because you yeah. are going to break it. I'll tell why, you now. Why do you say that? Because the, the, the entire application is run off the of services, <laughs> yeah. so it totally runs off the database. Yeah. As soon as you start bringing data in, you are going to find problems with the application. But we're using all, we're using all the spreadsheets. I you will still problem. find problems. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you, UW is very, very technical. They've helped build the system. Yeah. It took them over seven months to get the data in working properly. The University of Maryland has a running system. And with lots of help from some KS4, which I wasn't happy. I mean, I didn't allow it, but the guys were stuffing out. Yeah. It took them over six months to give us data. So data is really not a minor issue. It's a huge, huge issue. You're going to break things left and right. It's going to be your largest pain for six to nine months. And and so and some Walk of in it, knowing this, yeah. yeah. And and so the, if the question is is why is why is that chunk of work so problematic? I mean, part of it's just about configuring the the types, right? Like, is this an alphanumeric? Is this you know? Is this how many how many uh, columns, requiredness, so what the system considers required versus what you're going to leave blank and isn't required. So you have to go in then and, and you kind of think it's not required, but it really was. Um, the I mean, there's just like 50,000 little things about the dictionary, and we don't have a standard way yet of saying, well, it, you can't go into the database and just change the dictionary easily everywhere norms going of course you can you can change it but you're not it's really hard to find all of the places that all of the spaghetti right. goes to so you can change it in one spot but it's you know you've got that same thing 15 other places that you have to go then fix so when we were dealing with the process that's exactly what happened we had to go through it and brian and his group would find oh okay you know, here's another Here's another required field, no, and so they were back to us and say, okay, we don't have that data. What would we what are we going to throw in there? What's this going to be the cost value that we put in front of uh, and, 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 and we really weren't, you know, we were just kind of we just were trying to get a more descriptive how to load that data in there. Yeah. So, you know, as we go through this exercise, we're trying to be really <clears throat> the exercise that you guys have been going through, we really know where the data is coming from. Um, you know, we might have some of those things that are Right, right. Well, I mean, one of the things, and this this is just the truth about it, is that the, the you know in theory, the if you can load the data through through the services, the application should work. And the, the reason why I say in theory is because the dictionary is supposed to be ratcheted oh, down yeah. tight enough to make sure that happens. The truth is, though, we don't have as many validations. We, didn't, we don't have as many validations in there as as actually the application screens are expecting. So sometimes the application screen is expecting this data field to be there. And this is, and yet the dictionary isn't actually validating that. And and, and unfortunately, we're just we didn't actually but have time to go through and put all the things. Right, if you ask me, though. Excuse me. The services are built correctly, if you ask me. So I I, I think maybe the the validation is appropriate. The screen sometimes maybe are too. Restrictive, but it is yeah. it is. So I'm, yeah, that's and that's really where the problem. I actually think some of these things should be now be built into the dictionary. I just know that we didn't. That nobody's ever had time to put those requirements in, in constraints into the dictionary and factor them back out um, and make Michelle sure. Michelle told me so. yesterday you're going to load your data multiple times. Yeah. You will load your data multiple yeah. times. I assume, I assume that. I'm yeah, I mean, remember that little system. flow chart. Yeah. yeah. Just because people are surprised, they're just like, oh, you know, USC, I think, went through this process. They thought, oh, I'm going to load my data once. It was a database guy that was leading up the effort. Yeah. So his whole mindset was, I'm just going to load it for SQL. And they were like, no, it's, it, it's not going to work. And this yeah. is why and they didn't believe us. <laughs> and so after three months, they said, never mind, we're not going to do it. <laughs> we're like, okay, we tried to tell you ahead of time, it is going to take multiple times. It's going to take you months to do it already. You are going to have issues. And go through the services, at least it has most of the validations. Yeah. He was trying to skip all that. Um, and it's just a nightmare that it's almost impossible to go to the server. Yes. And that's why I want to have that other environment. I want to have a data conversion environment so that once we get some data in here and the system is working, 
have been broken down to be broken today so that as you guys are trying to work through some of your tests on things and we're still working on bringing more data in, we're not breaking things into what you try to test for. And, and just so you know, we have 13 environments um, at KS. So when you talk yeah. about dev and QA, you're going to need multiple dev environments. So I'll just kind of warn you so about, 15, about that. Yeah. You're going to need one for people doing the coding, one for people doing the database prop properly, at least up front. Maybe later on you can convince some of those. But here again, you're, you're not going to get away with three environments. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's something that they have to be really close. Yeah. Norm, all this, yeah. Yeah. And they, all, they can all be on a VM or something. Or they all should be. Yeah. 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 yeah that's you want to be able to bring them up and bring them down yeah. and throw them away and clean them up. And, yeah. No, I just want to make clear that they don't have to be physical servers. I just assume nobody has to 